When I visited Robert Valenzuela in uh, Mount Sinai, New York, I was deeply impressed by two things. <clears throat> the first is that Mai, he's a true innovator of the penile prosthesis surgery. So he's the one actually, you know, who showed me how to do a subcoronal approach. And uh, I showed him how to do a local anesthesia back then when, I, when he visited my practice. So uh, when I visited his office, uh, his surgery, he was not doing subcoronal only. He was using all three approaches, crotal, infrapubic, and subcoronal, uh, for the different patient uh, scenarios. So he never satisfied with the surgery what he was doing. So he's keep renovating his surgery dramatically so that he can uh, serve his patients better. The second thing which impressed me is that uh, even though he had a senior residence all through his cases, he didn't ask her to do any uh, actually job. He was letting her to learn how to do the surgery, how to you know, lead the case, but he was the one who was doing the case all through the time. He was doing tedious job as well, like a suturing and the other stuffs. Um, I, could, I was able to feel a, his strong I mean, uh, responsibility toward his patients. After all, patients came to us to get the surgery from us, not the others. Uh, so Robert take responsibility and that's the reason why I believe he did the case all the time. When doing a case, I do the same way Robert does. So in that kind of sense, I respect his uh, responsibility, sense of responsibility toward his patients. And so originally, I did not start off to do prosthetic urology or to be sexual medicine. Um, it was primarily a general urology, uh, family practice, pretty much a community practice where I focused mostly on BPH and prostate cancer. So originally, I was doing about 100, 125 radical prostates a year. I was doing a lot of TURPs. But what wound up happening was a lot of those patients are part of the community, and as a physician for the community, you want to treat all the conditions. Oh, yeah. So I started doing penile prosthesis to take care of those guys that didn't respond to medication. And as it turns out, I was invited to go see Dr. Wilson. So what really sparked my interest was when I went to see Dr. Wilson. And to tell you that first year, I was doing about 20, 25 prostheses a year. After I saw Dr. Wilson, my first year was 83 prostheses, wow. <laughs> which is very impressive. For a community guy to do 83 prosthesis in a year. Yeah. Thereafter, it was a landmark year because after that I've been doing over 100 every year. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty impressive, again, for a community uh, practitioner. But I still did not give up my community practice. I still like the BPH, I still like the prostate cancer and play. I began to see a shift. Mm -hmm. As robotics came into play mm -hmm. around 2004, 2005, 2006, the number of radical prostates that I was doing was going down mm -hmm. and the number of penile prostheses I was doing was going up mm -hmm. because I like to operate, I like to be in the operating room and a lot of the patients were not going for robotics. Yeah. So my last radical prostate I did in 2011. Wow. I uh, opened mm -hmm. uh, because I don't do robotics. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did it was because I did his brother five years before uh -huh. and his brother was potent and dry. <laughs> so his brother said, I don't care who does robotics, I don't care what they do, this is what I want to get done, I want you to do it. So that was my last radical prostate, and sure enough, it's now six years later, uh, he's potent and dry. Oh. Good got lucky. Yeah. No, I got lucky, he, he did good. <laughs> but, uh, so that's been the evolution, mm. and so my interests have peaked, uh, my practice has changed drastically over the years. So I've changed my approach three times and I continue to evolve because I think it's a field that's growing. Um, there's a lot to be offered and over the next couple of years I hope to offer a lot more innovative ways of treating sexual dysfunction, not just erectile dysfunction. You know, over the years I, I, I used to do all penoscrotal cases and that was great because that's what I trained with after watching uh, Dr. Wilson. Then in 2006, I saw Dr. Perito's video, and I was like, wow, this is great. It's so fast, you get it done, you're out of there, it looks great, and it's very easy. So I said, you know, I switch. So from 2006 to 2014, I started doing all infrapubics. Mm. 
And then in 2014, I went to Brazil. Mm. That changed my practice completely. Mm. So you know that one of the things that when you do a penile prosthesis, is one of the things you have to tell the patient is your yes. penis make it shorter. That has changed. Mm. I no longer tell my patients that your penis make it shorter. I tell them, in fact, it may get a little bit longer. Is that okay with you? And what do you think they say? Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> we want to make it bigger. But so that has really changed. So I, I think um, watching Egidio do his sliding technique and doing the subcoronal has really was very memorable mm. above everything else because we all struggle with length and yeah. we know in the penis size matters yeah, yeah right. whether we like it or not size matters you know women say it doesn't <laughs> we know it does <laughs> well the whole idea is it's a collaboration you don't exist alone you can't exist in a vacuum because if you do all you're going to do is continue to do the same thing yeah. Had I not gone to these conferences before, had I not gone to see Dr. Wilson, had I not seen the burrito, had I not gone to Brazil, I wouldn't know anything any better. And I would think that I'm doing just great and continue doing the same thing. So the idea is to continue to evolve, share with others, train others so you can pass on those skills. Otherwise, if nobody sees what you're doing, nobody really can appreciate it and nobody can critique it. You know, you can be your best critic but others around you will be able to tell you what they see and how they perceive your work. And I think that's very, very important. Absolutely, every, I, I take away something from every single physician that comes to my operating room. Oh. They all share something with me mm -hmm. that I ultimately will ch may change a little something in what I do. Mm -hmm. And they make suggestions. And these little suggestions really come in handy because they come from a different walk of life, different kind of training. Mm -hmm people who I haven't been exposed to, and they bring those experiences to you. So they may take away my experience, but I get to learn from them as well. So I think that's just as important. You know, it's very funny because um, when it comes to the treatment of erectile dysfunction, it had always been a by the way question. You know what that means? You do the full counsel with the patient, you talk about BPH, you talk about prostate cancer, you talk about everything. And then just as the patient is leaving, they put their hand on the doorknob, they turn around and they go, by the way, doc, and you know that gave you chest pain because it's not something you want to talk about. You knew they were going to talk about erectile dysfunction right off the back. So now my practice has evolved to the point that I ask the question right up front. Uh, it is part of my initial uh, interview, mm. but that's what I do. Mm. So it's important to get it out. Mm. Number one is it's a major practice builder for, the, for, for physicians. Mm. Number two, Erectile dysfunction has been associated with so many other medical conditions. We know it's a marker yeah. for cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Just like the arteries in the penis get small, the arteries in the penis in the heart get small as well. But more importantly, you may show up, this may be a precursor to a heart attack. A guy with problems with erection, this may be a precursor mm. to them getting a heart attack a year or two years later. Mm. Right. So, the idea is it is just as important. If your physician does not want to hear you talk about erectile dysfunction, then have them refer you to a specialist mm. or find somebody mm. else. Mm. The beauty about it is, is that now you can find somewhere anywhere. Mm. You no longer have to depend on your physician to refer you. Yeah. You could go online, you could read newspapers, you have uh, all kinds of advertising that you can find someone that you can talk to about these problems. Mm. And it may be just as little as taking a pill modifying your, 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 your daily habits. Mm -hmm. All these little changes may improve not only your erectile function, but your overall well-being. And we know that erectile dysfunction also affects you psychologically. For men, we are driven by testosterone. Mm -hmm. Our brains are driven. So we fixate on the fact that if you can't get an erection, you can get very frustrated mm -hmm. just thinking about it day in, day out, and it can affect every aspect of your life, your family life, your work life, your social life, and may ultimately lead to depression if you don't address it. I think out of all my experiences, just, I, I think the move that I recently made, going from being in private practice and the community physician, um, being received in the academic, yeah. uh, in, in the academic uh, field. Because as a community physician, you focus on your practice, you stay within your community, and very rarely do you branch out, or rarely you go to the conferences, but you don't really participate. Mm. My ability to be able to participate, to be able to share my experiences, 
I think that's been very valuable and very satisfying for me. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy going to the meetings, being part of the meeting, sharing and, and you know, presenting my work as well as listening to other people's uh, work. I think, you know, part of training, okay, is we all talk about see one, do one, teach one. Yeah. But, you know, these are my patients. I take primary responsibility. Mm. I have to see those patients post-op. Mm. The residents don't see them. Mm. And yes, these are the boring parts, but the idea is that if they see me doing it repeatedly, mm. ultimately, when I give in the reins and mm. when uh, I allow them to do a little bit more, then they feel more confident, oh. rather than guiding them mm. through the process. And prosthesis cases are very tricky. Mm. The, we believe that the longer you are in the operating room, the longer you increase, the more you increase the chances of getting infection or having yes. complications. Yes. So you really want to move very quickly. Mm. And if I feel like the resident or the person that I'm working with is not up to par mm. and doesn't hasn't really reviewed the anatomy well and doesn't recognize it, then I, I, I am more inclined to do more of the procedure. Mm. If I feel the resident's very competent, mm. has reviewed it, has done enough cases with me, then I give up a little bit more of the range. But ultimately, it's my responsibility. Ultimately, it's I'm the one, I'm the one that's doing the case, and I want to make sure that things turn out as best as possible. When I was in medical school, mm. my idea was to serve my community. Uh. And I felt that going straight from residency to my community, and I actually work in a Hispanic community, 95% of my patients are Hispanics, I felt that that's what I wanted to do. Mm. I, I didn't, I, I got excellent training as a resident. Mm. I felt that I came out and I was able to do everything. Mm. In my first year, I was doing radical prostates, I, I did cystectomies, I do, did an RPL and D. So all these cases are very complex cases, but I felt that my training was excellent. Mm -hmm. Going out and getting further training and, and subspecializing was not in my cards. My, in my cards was not to become an academic, but a community physician to give back to my community, to work with, with the community. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, for, for 15 years, that was fine until I stumbled upon something different that I felt that needed to be shared. Mm. And at that point that I felt that I have something to offer. Mm. And not only that, you, th you see the climate in medicine, how it's changing. Mm. It's very difficult for a, pri for a, a private physician to now exist on their own mm. um, because of the insurance issues, because mm. of all the regulations. It's very difficult. It's gotten very expensive and very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And so the academic world uh, or the academic institution has given me that, that backing that I needed as well to continue my work. Size matters. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Size matters, and I think that is the bottom line. Mm. Um, I like to think of penile prosthesis surgery almost like a plastic surgery, almost like breast implants. Mm. You notice how they continue to evolve. They went from making a small incision, they have the incision in the crease, the incision in the arm, anything to make it look as natural as possible. Mm. I feel with penile prosthesis, that's the case. Mm. You really need to focus on trying to make it as cosmetic as possible. Mm. Guys don't share. They don't go around showing their, like women show their breasts. Guys don't share that. They, they're in the dark and most people feel like it doesn't really matter as long as it works. But that's not true. When the guy looks himself in the mirror, he wants to look down and feel like he looks natural. Mm. That he can feel comfortable with himself. Mm. Not have to see all these tubings, what they call the Maserati penis, you know, the little yeah. spikes. and the, It just doesn't look good. You, and you want the guy to feel good about it. So for me, Doing a penile prosthesis has become almost like doing a plastic surgery case. I want to make it look, if you can, <laughs> make that penis look as good as it possibly can look or as natural as it can look. <laughs>